When most of us think of food, it might seem like a straightforward and clear definition of what differentiates food from other consumables. But as we'll see in the next few lectures, the boundaries that separate food for nourishment versus things that we eat as food are culturally determined and can easily blur. This is the case when we explore food as recreational drugs. These boundaries have blurred throughout human history. Psilocybin, or hallucinogenic mushrooms, is a fantastic example of this relationship. Food, drug, or both. Humans have had a long history with psilocybin, with evidence dating back to the Aztecs. During pre-Columbian times, the mushrooms we now know as psilocybin were called God's flesh by the Aztecs. The Mexican mushroom had cult status among natives, and even the Spanish conquest in the 16th century didn't disrupt mushroom worship. Its use continued during Spanish occupation. The effects of the sacred mushroom were known to shamans and healers, who believed that the mushroom's power would be diminished or used in a profane way if it fell into the hands of a white man. So they kept it a tightly guarded secret from non-natives until the beginning of the 20th century. And it was at this point that anthropologists reported that native Mexicans consumed mushrooms as a means to put themselves in touch with the gods, provide guiding hallucinations and mystical knowledge. But it wasn't until Life magazine published an article in 1957 that Americans discovered the spiritual mushrooms. The article, titled The Discovery of Mushrooms That Cause Strange Visions, was the first account from a Westerner who had actually experienced the Mexican mushrooms. The article gave not only a description of the trip, but it came complete with photos and drawings. American readers were stunned by the ethereal effects. The Life article was written by R. Gordon Wasson, a Wall Street banker. For 30 years, he and his wife Valentina had been part-time researchers who set out to document the cultural and historical use of fungi. The new scientific discipline was called ethnomycology, from the Greek word mykos, meaning fungus. Wasson's article was the impetus for experimentation with hallucinogens in the 1960s. The counterculture at that time believed that drugs such as psilocybin, the active ingredient in the mushrooms, and LSD brought the mind and the spirit together in the quest for transcendental knowledge. Wasson's book, Mushrooms, Russia, and History, was published at the same time that the Life article was released. Only 512 copies were printed, so by the late 1970s, it was worth $2,500 on the market. The book describes their study of the role that mushrooms play in different cultures, and it eventually led them to its practice in Mexico. The journey began in 1927 in the Catskill Mountains, New York, where the Wassons were on their honeymoon. On an afternoon outing, Valentina, who was Russian, found and picked mushrooms to cook and eat. Gordon, an American, was appalled at the idea. He was frightened that all were poisonous. The newlyweds decided that these two opposite attitudes were cultural in nature and not based on food availability. They believed that history must have caused the differences, both psychologically and culturally, with religion playing some part as well. Soon after, they set out to investigate their hypothesis. Gordon and Valentina began their research in Siberia, where the fly agaric mushroom is part of the cuisine and cultural tradition. It was used by shamans and proved to have an ancient religious link. Lewis Carroll is said to have known about the fly agaric mushroom and its powers and used it in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The scene where Alice takes a bite of mushroom and it alters her size is thought to be a direct reference. Siberian fly agaric users would sun dry the mushroom and then mix it with water or milk before eating it. Sometimes women would soften the mushrooms in their mouths before giving it to the shaman. Effects included convulsions, hallucinations, purported superhuman power, distortion of size, and a connection with the spirit world. According to Simon Powell in his book, The Psilocybin Solution, the Wassons discovered that there was a tradition in this region of drinking urine after ingesting fly agaric to prolong the effects. Siberian tribes may have discovered this technique by observing reindeer that also supposedly fed on mushrooms 
and licked human urine very enthusiastically. The Wassons theorized that the Siberian shamans kept the mushroom from other tribesmen and cloaked it in secrecy and taboo for the layman. The warning attached to the spiritual mushroom lived on long past the shamans and resulted in an aversion to mushrooms as they trickled into northern Europe. As the couple explored the world during their research quests, they found a wide array of words for the mushrooms across cultures. Toadstool, for example, links toads to mushrooms, and toads were considered sinister in much cross-cultural folklore. Even today, many people think that mushrooms are edible and toadstools are poisonous, even though there's no scientific division between the two. Decades before, anthropologists had noted the use of magic mushrooms in ceremonies, but since they were rarely invited to participate, the reports went largely unnoticed. However, in Oaxaca, Mexico, Wasson gained the confidence of a local shaman who allowed him to partake of the sacred psilocybin mushroom. As he lay in bed in a dark room, he started to see motifs that then turned into lavish castles, gardens, mythical beasts, chariots, and mountains. Wasson later claimed that the visions were more real than anything he'd ever seen in reality. He had a profoundly spiritual experience and believed that the mushrooms allowed the user to penetrate some new realm of the psyche. Wasson hypothesized that these vision-producing fungi may have been the origins of the religious impulse, that the idea of deity arose when ancient ancestors first discovered the mushrooms and ate them. And he helped coin the term entheogen to refer to these fungi. The term means generating the divine within. Mexican Indians referred to psilocybin mushrooms with awe and reverence. They were never to be taken lightly. As William Blake wrote, once the doors of perception are opened, the infinite beauty of reality can be discerned. In decades to come, these magic mushrooms would inspire artists, intellectuals, and spiritual seekers. Psilocybin mushrooms were well known to the Aztecs. Their use was not kept secret, but instead played a large part in their culture. The Aztecs' consumption of the sacred mushroom was even documented by Spanish invaders. The Spanish translated Aztec archival documents as well. One example is the 1502 coronation of Montezuma. During the celebration, prisoners were slaughtered and their hearts offered to their pantheon of gods as sacrifice. Afterward, covered in blood, the Aztec revelers ate mushrooms to give themselves visions and revelations as they danced. The Spanish were horrified. Even though many religions around the world, including their own, were steeped in bloodshed through wars and persecution. The capital of the Aztecs was located where Mexico City is today. They had achieved great power and their civilization was at its zenith just prior to Cortez's arrival in 1519 with his gold-seeking conquistadors. Once the Spanish conquered and occupied for a time, they wiped out all of the Aztecs' religious practices, including the use of the sacred mushroom. They were dubbed blasphemous practices by Catholic invaders. While psilocybin had been documented before, it wasn't until Wasson's study was published that historians gave any credit to the role of psychedelic agents. They finally started to understand that these mushrooms had tremendous psychological power over the people who consumed them, and it helped shape their belief system within their cultures. Attesting to the significance and high status given to psilocybin mushrooms and other psychedelic flora by the Aztecs is a 16th century statue of their god of flowers. The god is depicted sitting cross-legged with an expression of pure ecstasy on his trance-like face. Around the base and on the figure are carved mushrooms and flowers known to be psychoactive species and revered by the Aztecs. Today, psilocybin mushrooms are illegal in the U.S., but Western travelers to places like Indonesia, Thailand, and Bali can easily buy mushroom omelets and cola mushroom shakes from the locals. In Holland, magic mushrooms are big business and are sold in the open market stalls where tourists flock to get their goodies. For a few years, psilocybin mushrooms could even be purchased in Britain until it became illegal again in 2005. Marketplaces exploded with the edible drug during that time. In 2004, at the Stonehenge Festival, the drug of choice was mushrooms. 
For a few years, anyone could get a do-it-yourself kit and grow their own, or find flyers advertising web-based companies that would deliver a dose directly to your door. Mushroom consumption is not just for festival goers and alternative cultures. Indeed, it became fashionable for businessmen, doctors, academics, and journalists to experiment with psilocybin mushrooms. Reflecting that trend, even the Oxford English Dictionary has the word shroomer defined in its voluminous text. This is a word for a person who enjoys eating magic mushrooms. Psychoactive fungi have been used since ancient times in religious ceremonies. Plato drank mushroom tea at the Greek rites of Eleusius, and mushrooms were eaten by the Celts and their Druid priests, by the Vikings, and later by medieval witches. So magic mushrooms have a very long history of use. Some blame Christianity or the Industrial Revolution for its period of decline from avid consumption. Until recently, that is, when the counterculture of the 1960s fueled intake again. Using current botanical estimates, there are about 209 hallucinogenic mushroom species. There are 76 known species of psilocybin mushrooms in Mexico alone. And Mexico remains the one country where there is truly an old and long-standing tradition of magic mushroom use. At low to moderate doses, psilocybin mushrooms make colors seem brighter, more saturated, and better defined. At very high doses, the consumer could easily lose touch with all reality and dissolve into a world of color and form. Reports suggest that most people ingest moderate doses and have a pleasant experience. Light becomes fractured, textured, and patterned. Long bouts of laughter may ensue as ordinary life is seen through a different and even comical perspective. When the user closes their eyes, the effects are felt the strongest. A fantasy universe materializes that writers have often struggled to describe. Psilocybin acts to disrupt neural communication networks, effectively rendering it hyperconnected. It breaks down and becomes psilocin. Once in the brain, it prevents the reuptake of serotonin. But it has a molecular structure that is similar to serotonin, so it can act on the neural receptors. And this is what causes feelings of pleasantness or hallucinations. But the effects are not always positive. Some people have negative hallucinations and can experience headaches, sweating, chills, and nausea. But the majority of people are reported to have positive experiences. Interestingly, the toxicity level is low in psilocybin mushrooms. So some suggest that this means that it would be very hard for someone to die from ingesting them. Furthermore, some believe that mushrooms aren't addictive, but that remains controversial. To magic mushroom lovers, these mushrooms are psycho-spiritual tools that give them a better understanding of self, of their place in the world, and some sort of essential truth. In addition to mushrooms, a very common edible drug all around the world is cannabis. With marijuana becoming legal in some states in the U.S., the sale of edible treats has risen. There's a growing preference for marijuana edibles among patients and recreational users alike. Many marijuana dispensaries look like cannabis candy stores and bakeries, where one can find everything from salad dressings and dips to gummy bears and cookies. In fact, you can infuse cannabis into just about any recipe that you can think of that includes butter or oil. Edible marijuana has been around for a while now. Brownies made with marijuana have remained popular since the 1950s, likely because the chocolate is very effective at covering up the marijuana taste. Evidence points to ancient people almost exclusively eating it rather than smoking it. They saved the seeds for food, and ate the flowers for medicinal, recreational, and spiritual use. One of the oldest recipes for cannabis-infused food is from India, called bang. Marijuana mixed with milk, almonds, and garam masala is widely consumed during the Hindu religious festival of Holi that celebrates the deity Shiva. The 19th century text, 1001 Nights, contains a story called the hashish eater, which is about you guessed it, a hashish eater. The practice of eating hashish was copied at Paris's famed Club des Hashishens. Frequent guests included Baudelaire, Dumas, and other literary notables. 
In the 1960s and 70s, so-called pot-smoking hippies became vegetarians and sought ethnic foods that were unheard of in the U.S., such as tofu, seaweed, curry, hummus, even burritos. It was this counterculture cuisine favored by health food junkies that provided the basis for the local food movement seen today based on organic, sustainable foods. And there's now even a stoner cuisine movement centered around the idea of creating unusual combinations of food and pairing unusual flavors while high on marijuana. Edible marijuana cookbooks abound and include not only recipes, but tantalizing photos of scrumptious food. The official High Times Cannabis Cookbook takes stoner cuisine very seriously, touting recipes for healthy and decadent dishes such as time warp tamales and psychedelic spanakopita. And it doesn't stop there. We can't forget to include restaurants. Even though New York is not one of the U.S. states that has so far legalized marijuana for recreational use, that hasn't stopped a new trend in the city. Marijuana restaurants. Online blogs abound with descriptions of two locations in particular. The first is the Filipino restaurant in the East Village. Here, cannabis-infused bone marrow is one item on the menu. The other example is in a basement dining room 10 feet below a Brooklyn warehouse. A party of 20 people are enjoying their five-course meal, all infused with cannabis, including a ribeye steak, dessert, and cocktails. There's laughs all around, and why shouldn't spirits be high? The diners certainly are. Who knows, with legalization taking off, marijuana restaurants could be the new culinary craze. In 1996, when California legalized medical marijuana, it opened the door for edible marijuana. Patients can ingest cannabis without damaging their lungs, without the smell of smoke on their hands and clothes, and use it more discreetly. Recreational users can catch a high by consuming marijuana without the stoner stigma attached to it. Both are finding the benefits of eating their herb, including a longer-lasting high for body and mind. Like wine tasting, cigar smoking, and gourmet cooking, pot also has differentiating smells for the aficionado. Terpenes, which are hydrocarbons found in the essential oils of plants, give pot and other foods their unique aroma and taste. Pairing the terpene of a certain marijuana strain with a food that has the same terpene is argued to make an unforgettable combination. Cannabis chefs argue that if you're making a citrusy treat, your best bet is to use a pot strain that is high in limonene, a terpene that takes its name from the lemon rind. The culinary community has also noted the rise in popularity of marijuana edibles and now offers cooking classes in certain states devoted to cooking with marijuana. In Denver, one such class is teaching cannabis cooks how to prepare recipes for treats such as chocolate-covered bacon and Swedish meatballs. The founder of one of these popular cooking schools, J.J. Walker, summed up the experience when he told the Associated Press, by the end of class, everybody's pretty stoned. One book titled Marijuana Edibles even claims that, quote, you'll be the star of your next potluck when you show up with a batch of some delicious low-dose edibles. Just be sure to label your goodies so that everyone knows that they contain cannabis." End quote. Eating edible marijuana treats causes a wide range of effects. Most people feel a combination of one or more of the following effects. Euphoria, sedation, relaxation, and possibly paranoia, anxiety, and increased appetite. Eating too much, however, is reported to be a very unpleasant experience, although not fatal, and can cause nausea, dizziness, extreme anxiety, and even hallucinations. With more states poised to legalize pot, marijuana industry professionals say that there is a veritable fortune to be made in cannabis-infused edible products. Mountain High Suckers, a Denver-based producer, had huge success selling lollipops to medical marijuana patients. Many edibles come with more than one serving size listed, so the consumer is often unsure of how much to take. In response, Champlain Valley Dispensary in Vermont has been successful with their portion-specific products by adding just the right amount of THC so that the consumer can eat the whole cookie and not overdo it. 
THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, is the compound found in marijuana that produces both the medical benefits and the psychoactive effects. The market for specialty candy is, a very, is very large and growing. According to the National Association for Specialty Food Trade, the average American eats 24 pounds of candy per year. Knowing this, the edible marijuana industry is making and selling cannabis candy at an incredible rate. Edibles may be popular items at dispensaries, but because the federal government still considers marijuana illegal, there are no universal standards in place for marijuana edibles. The number of states that have legalized cannabis, either for medical use and or recreational use, is growing considerably. Dispensaries work with many different manufacturers, all with differing strains and differing quality. So users aren't sure what they're getting. And as of yet, there are no federal agencies testing marijuana edibles for contaminants. In an effort to provide some regulation for the industry, Colorado, where marijuana is legal for both social and medical purposes, has put in place requirements for contaminant testing and potency testing. The state's Marijuana Enforcement Division enacted the regulations in March 2014. When potency was tested at one of the largest marijuana edibles manufacturer in the state, the THC levels were a minute fraction of what was stated on the label. But once standardized testing is fully in place, it may change the game for edibles. The practice of combining food with drugs may be linked to the idea of eating for enjoyment or pleasure. Have you ever noticed that the taste of a food that you love can transport you from your current state of mind to a state where there's only the relish of the food? Most people have a favorite dish at a restaurant that they can't wait to enjoy. Or perhaps it's a certain meal that they like to cook or have a friend or family member create. The satisfaction and joy that you can get from your favorite foods can be a real high for many people. But is the only reason we eat food simply to fill our stomachs? Of course, we get energy from food intake, but it's much more than that. It can be one of the greatest pleasures of our lives. Studies have shown that food affects the pleasure centers in our brain the same way that drugs do. So there can be potential problems with overeating, just like drug abuse. But it's also been shown that food can make people happy, at least temporarily. Certain herbs, spices, and aromatics used in the kitchen can have a direct effect on mood. For instance, orange, rosemary, and lemon are argued to help energize. Lavender and sage are thought to be great stress relievers. And some argue that chamomile can ease insomnia, while mint and basil are thought to be mood boosting. Mood-affecting neurotransmitters in the brain are created by food compounds. Some foods are better at helping neurotransmitter production than others, and therefore affect mood to a greater extent. According to a study published in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, the number of stress hormones released in the body can be reduced by eating dark chocolate. The study found that people who identified as highly stressed and who ate a few pieces of dark chocolate on a daily basis for two weeks lowered their stress levels. Other foods linked to stress relief include turkey, walnuts, sweet potatoes, almonds, spinach, and salmon. Of course, there's no way to know whether there is a direct link between eating the foods and a reduction in stress, but many food aficionados are convinced. Terms in popular culture, such as chocoholic and carbohydrate addict, tell us that people understand that food can be an addiction. When referring to food, some people use the terms craving or withdrawal or needing a fix of some particular type of food. In human studies conducted on eating disorders, such as obesity and binge eating, people often use the term addiction to describe their relationship with food. Interestingly, new research shows that our brains can view delicious foods as drugs. Ice cream and other high-calorie foods can elicit cravings and trigger responses similar to those caused by addictive drugs like cocaine. Using functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, brain scans, researchers showed pictures of a chocolate milkshake to women who had self-reported food addictions. 
Upon viewing the milkshake, the women displayed increased activity in the same regions of the brain that fire when people who are dependent on drugs or alcohol experience cravings. When presented with the same milkshake, women who did not report food addiction showed much less activity in those regions. Some studies have shown that certain foods trigger a reward center in the brain. Other studies show certain foods trigger similar patterns to those of addictive drugs. Research on obesity continues to probe a similar link. The difficulty is differentiating between brain scans that show addiction, cravings, and pleasure. Some recent studies show that highly processed foods share properties with drugs of abuse due to their fat content and or refined carbohydrates, along with the rapid rate that refined carbs are absorbed into the system. Food addiction is characterized by loss of control over consumption, continued use despite negative consequences, and an inability to cut down despite the desire to do so. Addictive-like eating has been associated with an increase in impulse and emotional reaction, which are similar to substance abuse. In other words, they share some common behavioral patterns. Food addiction typically happens when a person is predisposed to addictive behavior, and the food itself contains an addictive agent. Most addictive foods have been altered or processed in a way that increases their abuse potential. There are naturally occurring foods that contain sugar, which is refined carbohydrates, like fruit, and those that naturally contain fat, like nuts, but rarely does a food contain both. However, palatable processed foods have been altered to contain elevated amounts of both. Think cake, pizza, and chocolate bars. There's also been a steep increase in the availability of these highly processed foods. Like drugs of abuse, highly processed foods have been made to trigger addictive-like biological and behavioral responses due to their high reward level. And both contain a higher dose of addictive ingredients. Addictive substances, both food and drugs, have been processed to increase the rate at which the addictive substance is absorbed into the blood. For example, when a coca leaf is chewed, it has very little addictive power. But when it's processed into a high dose with rapid delivery to the system, it becomes the highly addictive cocaine. Similarly, highly processed foods are likely to cause a blood sugar spike. This is important because it's been shown that there's a link between glucose levels and the activation of parts of the brain that are involved with addiction. According to the Yale Food Addiction Scale, the top 15 addictive foods are dinner rolls, soda, fried chicken, gummy candy, cereal, muffins, cheeseburgers, buttered popcorn, cake, chips, cookies, pizza, french fries, ice cream, and topping out the list at number one, chocolate. Doing drugs just like overeating junk food, causes the brain's pleasure centers to overload. Eventually, the pleasure centers reach a plateau. So to feel the same pleasure, a person has to increase the amount of food or drugs. We've learned a lot about these links by studying animal-based models. According to one scientist studying these effects, Dr. Paul Kenny, people somehow know that there has to be more to overcoming overeating than just willpower. He states, quote, there's a system in the brain that's been turned on or overactivated, and that's driving overeating at some subconscious level. In his study, published in Nature Neuroscience, Kenny and his colleagues studied three groups of lab rats for 40 days. One of the groups was fed regular rat food. A second was fed bacon, sausage, cheesecake, frosting, and other fattening high-calorie foods, but only for an hour each day. And the third group was allowed to feast on highly processed foods for up to 23 hours a day. As you can imagine, the rats in the third group that stuffed themselves with fattening human foods became obese. Using implanted brain electrodes, the researchers found that these rats developed a tolerance to the pleasure the food gave them and had to eat more and more in order to feel the same gratification. Compared to rats in other studies that were given high doses of cocaine and heroin, similar brain reactions were found. 
Dopamine, a neurotransmitter in the brain, is the likely culprit for the behavior of the obese rats. It's involved in the brain's pleasure or reward center. When the rats overeat, the levels of a dopamine receptor dropped. Low levels of the same dopamine receptor have been detected in humans who are addicted to drugs or are obese. Although he acknowledges that his research may not directly translate to humans, County says the findings shed light on the brain mechanisms that drive overeating and could even lead to new treatments for obesity. Animal research doesn't always translate directly to humans, but it does give us clues about brain functions and how they affect behavior, such as what drives overeating. And these studies could help lead to treatments not only for obesity, but drug addiction as well. So the next time that you're craving a chocolate bar or a cookie, remember that the distinction between eating for nutrition and eating for pleasure is blurred. Throughout human history and around the world, people have been consuming foods not only for the nourishment, but for the psychological effects, whether it be a magic mushroom, a pot brownie, or an order of french fries.